You may be familiar with Sweden, the land of meatballs, Ikea, Viking metal, and Europop, all in one place. But Sweden just kind of does its thing with its hippie Scandinavian siblings. It hasn't been a big hitter since the Viking Age, right? Wrong. Please welcome Charles the Twelfth, or Carolus Rex if you want to make obscure references and sound as pretentious as I do. The boy king who actually gave a concerted effort to not leave his kingdom in shambles. Not that it really helped that much. Now you may be thinking to yourself, Boy, that's a lot of Charleses. I never knew Sweden had so many Charleses. That's because Charles the Twelfth is actually the sixth Charles of Sweden, because Charles the Ninth, who was actually the third Charles, didn't have access to Wikipedia. Just a book of Swedish history that was more fiction than fact, and besides, all the other cool European countries have really old monarchies. Look at France, it's Louis all the way down. Technically, he wasn't even a Charles, he was a Karl, and he lived in Sverig, but hey, Sweden can't complain with Finland next door. The truly wonderful thing about Charles is that I don't have to talk about about his early life and reign separately, because he got himself crowned when he was only 15. As you might expect, his first few years were spent living pretty large. If Brahe wasn't enough to convince you that Scandinavians know how to party, the summer of 1698 became known as the Gotarp Fury, when Charles and his cousin Frederick galloped through the streets of Stockholm, knocking off people's wigs, throwing furniture out the windows, it was madness. To be fair, Frederick was kind of a bad influence, since after he left, Charles got back to kingly things, but then he came back to party like it's 1699 and they got a bear so drunk that it fell through a window. It was really dangerous to stand up underneath the palace windows when Frederick was in town. You never knew what was gonna come out of there. Sweden's neighbors saw what was going on and figured this kid didn't really need all that land in Denmark and the Baltic states. So Denmark, Norway, Saxony, Poland, Lithuania, and Russia, which believe it or not were ruled by only three people at the time, decided they would take it off his hands. Now usually I'd have to leave it at that, but this month is special because I've got my buddy Kinetic History here to offer a little background on why everybody was so ready to gang up on poor Sverdik. Thanks, Jack. Believe it or not, Sweden was one of the great European powers of this era. Over the last hundred years, it had slowly but surely built an impressive empire focused on controlling this area here, the Baltic Sea, which was strategically important for trade and the European economy. This area had been one of great contests between the Swedish and Danish kingdoms, so much so that there's even a memorable name for this contest, Dominium Maris Baltici. After a long period of Danish control, Sweden had finally succeeded in gaining dominion over this area by the 1660s, but Denmark never took her eyes off it. During the Thirty Years' War, Sweden humiliated Denmark, gained a number of territories, and succeeded in confirming its place as a major power in Europe. While Sweden had fought with Russia in this war, Tsar Peter the Great was now looking to challenge Sweden to reclaim some of the lands they had taken from them in 1617, which had cut Russia out of the Baltic picture. As Jack has already explained, Charles was a young king, a very, very young king, and this naturally made him seem weak and incapable to Sweden's angry neighbours. They believed, as we all would, that an 18-year-old monarch with a fondness for throwing furniture out of palace windows would be an easy mark. And so all it took was this guy, Johann Putkul, to conduct secret diplomacy with the leaders of Russia, Denmark, Norway, Saxony, and Poland, Lithuania, and hey presto, those nations formed into an alliance against Sweden. Then, on the 22nd of January 1700, the Great Northern War began, and Charles' reign was never the same. Thanks, mate. He just released a behemoth of a video covering everything you need to know on the Vietnam War. It's pretty cool, you should check it out. So Sweden was actually in the big leagues, can you believe it? Just because Sweden was outnumbered doesn't mean it was outmatched. The Karelians had a reputation for being super well-trained and totally badass. They lived up to that reputation, and Charlie wasn't too shabby himself once he gave up drinking. Sure, the Russians alone came at him with an army three times the size at Narva, but with the blizzard bearing down on the enemy, he gave the mighty Swedish battle cry, Leroy Jenkins, broke the Russian lines and sent them packing. So much for peace. Peter the Great. Next, he launched a counteroffensive on Poland, beat down an army twice his size at Fraustadt, and dethroned Augustus the Strong. It takes more than some Joe Schmo to beat guys with these kinds of names. Unfortunately, he may have gotten a bit too keen, because he tried to take down Russia once and for all by marching on Moscow. In the winter. Which, as anybody who's ever historyed before will tell you, is perhaps the biggest military no-no you can make. Especially when it's the coldest winter in the past 500 years. Peter, in response, began the noble Russian tradition of steadily retreating and destroying everything useful in Operation Russian Winter. Which isn't code for anything, it's just that Russia really sucks in the winter. Despite the odds, Karolas continued to find victory after victory, but the problem with being the little guy is that it only takes one decisive defeat to throw you out of the ring. That defeat came in 1709 at the Battle of Poltava, where nearly the entire Swedish army was killed and forced to surrender. But old Chuck wasn't finished yet, by golly. He fled to the Ottoman Empire, who hated Russia the way Scots hated other Scots. He got the Ottomans to pick up where he left off, but it wasn't too long before the whole affair fizzled out. So Charles and his band of 1,500 Swedes were stuck in the Ottoman Empire in what was effectively a Swedish colony paid for by the Sultan. Eventually, the people got sick of the government paying for Charles' expenses, so they stirred up a Galebelik and got him under house arrest, so the government could pay for his expenses. Finally, he took the hint and returned to Sweden for the first time in 14 years, only to discover the country had become an absolute mess, this time because of more 
more than defenestrated bears. In his absence, the country was being slowly consumed by Russia, Saxony, Hanover, Denmark, even Great Britain because hey, they didn't want to be left out of a good land grab. Naturally, the first thing Charles did was invade Norway. It, it was so the Danes would lose their supply lines. It actually made sense, but still. He launched an assault on Norway and was forced to retreat. Then he launched another assault and was forced to retreat, thinking to himself, why isn't this working? Where is my mojo? In 1718, he gave it one more shot. He was supervising the trench diggers that fateful night, boosting morale next to the 60 diggers who'd already been shot when... What you say? Oh, that you only meant well. Now, in all likeliness, it was a shot from one of the Danes thinking, Hey, look, he's wide open. But why accept historical evidence when there are conspiracy theories to be perpetuated? Let's just say there were those on the Swedish side who wanted to see the war come to an end, and Frederick I was real quick to back out and drop Sweden's high taxes. But when Charles went down, he took the rest of the empire with him. Its lands were ravenously devoured, and power was quickly shifted away from the monarchy and given to the parliament, which is... A real shame, because Sweden wasn't the hotshot it used to be. Sure, Sweden made a progressive shift towards democracy and eventually entered the prosperous age of liberty, but, but it's not the same. Special thanks to Bazran66 for suggesting this guy and giving me more than enough info to work with. If there's someone you'd like to see me cover, let me know in the comments. I can't make any promises, but I've discovered that history is a big field, and there are a lot of cool people I don't know anything about. And of course, a big thank you to Kinetic History for working with me on this. Go check out his channel if you haven't already. See you next time.